Good morning, New Trail. Good morning. All right, it's so great to hear all the fellowship going on. Let's go ahead and stand up and continue our worship in the Lord. Huh? Anna Lee is Elden on. Play. Guitar. Okay, we got gotcha. you. right come on Absolutely. he's gonna make you sing again if you don't come on there you go have a home prepared where the saints are just over in the glory Over in the 
glory land, just over in the glory land, there with the mighty hosts I'll stand, just over in the glory land, I am on my way to the mansions there, just over in the glory land, there to sing God. First of all, like thank you in every language a million times to everyone who came out yesterday and worked so hard. It was hot. There was a lot of work to do, but we got it done, guys. Thank you. You're all appreciated so much. And if you missed, if you didn't get to come, you missed out on cinnamon rolls and juice and some really fantastic fellowship. General Assembly is this week, and the meal that we are serving is the 24th, next Sunday evening. We still are needing helpers, um, so there's plenty of places to plug you in at. So if you would like to, or maybe you get told to assist, <laughs> we'll put your name down. And if you are a helper that's already signed, has signed up, report to Revolution Church I actually meant to say Crossroads Church. Just get over there at 3 o'clock in Salina. We're going to have it. It'll be in both buildings. So Crossroads Revolution, you'll find us. Okay? All right. That's all I have. Morning, Trail. Good morning. Good to see you this morning. I affirm what uh, Lisa has said. Thanks for all the, the hands that helped and worked and made the job so easy yesterday. And uh, I'll tell you what. Uh, the retired folk know how to work. I'll tell you what. Now, I want to say one thing, and I understand that we didn't have instructions. Now, out here, you know we took a rail or a split rails out of the middle of the drive. Now, I want to tell you something. You are to park this way, not this way. And it's not a bad thing if you did this way because you didn't know different. I, I started that. this way. I started that. You're guilty? I'm guilty. Because that way people can park in, in or out, and they can just pull out either way. So you're guilty. Okay, guilty. It's Alicia's fault. We didn't get the info. I'm preaching this morning on the, how we're accusers, and we're not to be accusers. And so guess what we're doing? We're accusing each other this morning. <laughs> but you know what? We're going to be here to worship the Lord because the Bible says 
In Psalms tw uh, 37, 23, the Lord makes firm the steps of those who delight in him. We're called to delight in the Lord. That means to find joy in what God is doing and we celebrate him. You know, sometimes we come together and we think we're here to do our duty. No, you're not. This isn't a duty. This is a privilege. We're here to worship the Lord and delight in him. I guarantee you, the reason we cleaned up yesterday because we were anticipating, and I said to the group as we were getting the rails fixed around here at the end of the time, I said, so often we're ready for company, but we should be ready for company every time we're together. Amen. And that just when conference shows up. And so we, and I want to say something here about that. Sometimes I notice we get a little lax sometimes, and we kind of leave our, our bottles of water sitting around and everything else. You know what's really crucial is when we clean up what we have brought in. It makes it easier for those who clean, and it helps us to be a people that looks like we're prepared for what's going to happen next. And just encourage and thoughtful each other. Because I'll tell you what, it's really important to really encourage each other by, as people come in, they say, hey, this church cares. But the bottom line is, most of all important, is relationships. And that's what's the most important. Isn't that great? And we have that. We have a relationship with the Lord. So let's delight in him this morning. We're going to rock the Lord. And you say, how are we going to rock the Lord? Because you know what? Heaven wants to be rocked by our singing. And that's what it's about. So let's pray and ask the Lord for his blessing this morning. Lord, we love you today. We love you. We thank you. And we are grateful for your sustaining grace, your power. We thank you for that which we have been blessed with your presence for the last 168 hours since we last were together. We pray, Lord, today that we would be encouraged in spirit as we focus on Jesus. Let's be praising you because you are worthy of all our praise. I pray, Lord, this morning that all of us will be encouraged in the inner, our inner man as we look to be a people that focus on Jesus. So, Lord, today, would you also recognize that we want to come with our hearts praising you. So, Lord, it says in your word, we are coming to your presence with thanksgiving. And so we do so this morning. And, Lord, we do so as we do with praise, with our hearts ready to hear the word, but also as we give in our stewardship to you. May each of us be blessed because we are faithfully giving you what you desire of us to do. We love you with all our hearts. We praise you. We thank you. We give you our adoration and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. And God's people said, Amen. 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 Sandy, go ahead and come up. For those who are guests this morning, if you wonder how we do offering here, we pass the hat this morning. And so before, as we sing the first song, we always pass the hat. If you forget to give, the church is right at the back. You can put it in there as well. Sandy, I know what you're here for. Speak away. Hi. Um, is this on? Yep. Yes. Okay. On September 30th and October 1st, there's a woman's retreat. Jesus is the real deal. Many great speakers, they will be sharing their testimonies. You can go for one day or for two. And we will stay at the beautiful Dury Plaza in Wichita. Uh, monies need to be in by August 15th. I will share information with all you ladies. So just come to me and I'll give you a copy of this. Thank you. Hope to see you there. Thanks, Sandy. All right, let's go ahead and stand up. Let's raise a hallelujah. Praise the hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. I raise a hallelujah. 
the darkness flee. I raise a hallelujah in the middle of the mystery. I raise a have been hurt, defeated by someone that says they love us? How many? And I'm going to ask the same question. How many of us have hurt somebody we say we love? Okay. We've all got something to be ask for forgiveness for and we've all got something that we need to forgive and forget this deal is come to the altar are you hurt and broken within overwhelmed by the weight of your sin I mean everyday life we're going to go through stuff Somebody's going to hurt us. Somebody's going to pee us off. <laughs> yeah, and we're going to do that to somebody else. So as you sing this, give everything that you want dumped and dump it at this altar or at the foot of the cross at his feet and say, it's your problem. Help me through it. Help me forgive. So as we sing this. Are you hurt? 
Building and broken within Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin Jesus is calling He's calling Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Yes, he's calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness. It was bought with the, precious the blood, blood of, Jesus Christ. of Jesus Christ. Leave behind, behind your regrets and mistakes. Yeah, leave behind. Come today, there's no reason to wait. There's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. And he's calling. Bring your Bring sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes a new life is born. Jesus is calling. calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was born. blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, what a Savior. Isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah. Christ is risen. Bow down before sing that chorus some more and the altar is open and if you need someone to come up here we've got people who can pray with you oh come to the altar the father's arms are open wide forgiveness was bought with the precious blood Oh, wow. 
broken. We come to be renewed. We come to know the power of Jesus Christ. Lord, we're blessed by that opportunity that we don't have to bear it alone. We can dump it at Jesus' feet. And he'll take it for us. And we thank you for that today. May your grace be poured through this room. Because we recognize, as Terry Paul challenged us, we've hurt those we love and we've been hurt by those who love us. But you don't hurt us. You love us beyond the love we can grasp. Lord, remind us that we are called to represent Jesus one to another. And that we can lift each other. We can encourage and point each other to Jesus and looking face to face. And we find nothing but the receptive arms of the grace of Christ. May we recognize that today and live in that hope and that joy. In Jesus' name we pray. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. As we were singing those words, just and as Terry challenged us earlier before we sang them, I thought this week has been a <coughs> pastor's week. And one of my dear closest friends who I'm very close to, his mother died. And he's going through a lot of physical distresses. And I went to meet with him, and there's estrangement within his family from his sister. And, and uh, I took the time. As Beth and I went, my wife and my friend's wife had never met each other before. And God opened the door to really have a great opportunity of fellowship. And some of you might have seen it. It was a picture. Somebody, his wife took a picture. I was, be careful when you go visit people that got cameras laying around. Call a phone. Phone Pictures will show up in places you didn't expect. And I didn't know that she was going to post it as we were laughing and sharing together. And in the privacy of a moment between my wife and his wife, she said, this is the happiest I've seen him in a long time. There's brokenness and there's hurt. You know, we don't know how broken the world is, do we? We represent Jesus, folks. And we got to be the hope of Christ. And we got to be representing Christ. And, and I tell you what, God has really been pressing upon me, not just a lot of other people as well, but to him particularly, that I, there's some deep hurts. And I just need to be one who come alongside him and be there for him. And point him to Jesus as his hope. And remind him that, hey, Christ loved him and died for him. Isn't that wonderful? That Jesus loved us that much. Well, this morning, I want to say this. That we're living in a world of, we have become immensely accusatory. Everybody's the problem. Paul looks at me and says, it's your fault. I look at Paul, it's your fault. Right, Paul? Whatever it is, it's your fault. However, this morning it came to very, shall we say, a full circle in a great sense of humor. In a wonderful sense of humor is uh, there's an individual here that I have heard about since the day I was born 66 years ago. He was a classmate of my dad's. However, I've heard of him, and this is how I knew of him, because I've shared this before here, that there was a time that my dad and he went up in my dad's plane when they were in high school to do an experiment, and that was to see if a chicken could fly from 1,000 feet. <laughs> well, I don't have to tell you about that part of the end of the story. However, this morning, as I was, I, this week, I was given a, a private message that this gentleman would be here today and wanted to be in our service today, and I'm glad he's here because I had never had met him in all my 66 years. But he's here today. But I got to hear his side of the story. <laughs> and I want to say this. And I say it with humor. Even my dad's with the Lord now. Been nine years now. I heard it was dad's fault. It was his idea. And I'm sure it was knowing my dad. <laughs> However, my dear friend now, my friend, Maynard McAdams, who sits right here, he made it clear this morning, it was your dad's idea. Did I hear accusation passing the buck? Sure did. Brother Maynard, I couldn't pass it up. You gave me such a wonderful door this morning to walk through this morning for this message. But we have become a culture that passes the buck, haven't we? 
and I'm going to say it, not to be political, it's the Democrats' fault, it's the Republicans' fault, or maybe the independents, what few there are in our, our, our uh, mil, uh, governmental circle. Bottom line, we are passing the buck. We have been doing it for a long time. And when we sin, see sin creeping into our culture, we look at everything else but where we need to be looking as where the problem lies. If you have your Bibles, turn to Daniel chapter 9. Now, I want you to understand, I understand that Daniel is an Old Testament book. We're under the grace of Jesus Christ, and we're going to be looking at 1 John 1 and 2 as well this morning. But I want you to understand something. We are in a culture that God does not call us to be accusatory. In fact, I heard somebody this week that said to me, well, the fact is uh, about we can't judge. I said, hold on. We as Christians do not judge the world, but we judge each other. The, body tell, the Bible tells us we're to call the judge each other because we're to be walking how we're to walk with Jesus Christ. But we don't judge the world because they don't know any better. Those who don't know Jesus, they don't know the difference. And I find Christians are the stupidest people sometimes. I said it again, but I shouldn't say that. But I'm going to because we are sometimes the most knuckleheaded people because I've heard people on the radio when there's talk shows. I remember one time when... Um, I had his head, my name in my head. He took over the city of Antelope, Oregon, back when we were living there. Roshnees, thank you. And his second command, his name was Sharon. And the thing about it is she was asked to come to Christian radio and be on the radio to talk her viewpoint, and then people would call in. I was disappointed beyond belief of how they reacted to her and t- treated her. I mean, it was vicious. We're called to be the grace of Jesus Christ. I didn't say there was not sin in the camp. Bottom line is this. She doesn't know anything. She is so washed in her brain into what his thinking was. The fact is she wasn't ready to hear the Bible at all, and she really wasn't ready to hear the judgment of God's people on her. That's not our place. Our place is to show the grace of God. God will be the judge. We're called to express ourselves in grace. And I was never, it was so accusatory. I hated it. I was mad. Now, did I like what she was saying? No. But I also realized she didn't know any different. She didn't even know the Bible. She, so you know what's happened in our culture? We're becoming people that are accused of it. The church has become just like the world now. We accuse one another. I was humored, as I said. Paul and I look at each other and we give each other. We give each other fits all the time. Not that I don't give you fits. But he calls me his big brother. He's my little brother. He acts like a little brother. But anyway. <laughs> but we do. We do. We do that. Just, well, you know what? If you hadn't done this, you know, we do it for fun. However, the bottom line is when it gets serious, we're serious. And we take responsibility for that. But the bottom line is I see in Scripture, in Daniel chapter 9, we see what's happened. Get the context. Where's Israel? Where's the children of Israel? They're in Babylon. And now under the Medes and Persians. There's a reason they're there. It's because they have not been the people that God called them to be. And the whole problem is when we see sin creeping in the camp, we're seeing America falling apart, we as a church have become accusatory, and the world's getting accusatory of us. And sometimes we'll say the church, the world is probably right about what they're accusing. If we had been what God called the church to be, we would probably not be in the shape we're in. Does that make sense? We're called to be a people of righteousness and holiness, and we have been living just like the world. We've taken their patterns. We have seen our marriages go that we're in two-thirds of Christian, I'll put it, marriages in a divorce. Why? It's because the fact is we have not learned how to work through things and say, God, how do you call us to a commitment and how do we live that commitment? Because Jesus lived out the commitment to us. You know what? He could have had a few problems early on in his years. I mean, let's face it, in the silent years of Jesus... I'm sure he went through some pain and suffering. He could have said, why did I come here to try to come redeem these people? And he could have gone back to heaven. But no, he had a sense of commitment because he loved us so much. That's what marriage is about. It's a commitment that sometimes we don't like everything about each other, but we're called to be committed. But so often, what do we do in marriages? Well, if only he had done this. Or if he'd done this. You know, I love people when their marriages are falling apart. Not that I love they're falling apart. Let me get that qualified. But the bottom line is this, I'll look at people and I'll say, by the way, was he or she like that before you got married? Did they have those habits and characteristics? It's amazing. It's about 99%. Yep. Then what did you marry him for if you didn't want like it? Hello? (laughs) Marriage doesn't come easily, folks. It comes with a high price tag. I mean, let's face it. Y'all look at your spouse and go, boy, have you been difficult to live with for the last how many years? (laughs) But the bottom line is, 
We need this question, and we're going to look at that scripturally. We need to look at the question, how difficult have I been for you? Phew. Oh, I don't like that. Because you know what? I Recently, Beth, I've had some discussion, and she's been right the whole time. <laughs> I have not been easy to be with sometimes. I can be a pain, folks. I really can be. <laughs> At least she's over here going, really? <laughs> yes, I can be a pain. Nothing's new. But if you have your Bibles, we're going to look at what God tells us, and we see why, but then we're going to look at what God wants us to do, to not be accusers, but we recognize what we are called to do. If you start verse here in verse 4, Daniel says here, I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed, note that, I confessed, Lord, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments, we have sinned. And done wrong. We have been wicked and have rebelled. We have turned away from your commands and laws. We have not listened to your servants, this prophets who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, and our ancestors, and to all the people of the land. Lord, you are righteous. But this day we are covered with shame. The people of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Israel, both near and far, in all the country where you have been scattered us because of our unfaithfulness. I want to say something here. I know he says some things earlier, but notice, where does the accusatory spirit come from? Start, where does it start? It becomes part of us when we begin to unfaith, be unfaithful to the word of God and to God himself. Simple as that. Let's get it. We have been unfaithful. And the church in America has been unfaithful to that which God called us to be as a church. We've been unfaithful to the commands of his word. Why? Because we haven't been dwelling in the word. See, when we're not in the word, we, don't, we lose our compass. We lose the guide that we're called to follow because we fact that we can handle things ourselves. Because that's Satan's great lie. He wants us to be subtly sucked in with the lie, knowledge that we can handle the issues. And God says, no, you can't do it. And what happens when you become a people that don't follow the word? We become unfaithful. We we. we we, shall we say, smidge on corners, and pretty soon the smidge becomes a, I call it chasm, and we find ourselves far from God, and we wonder, where, where did God go? God didn't move. We did. So it's an old adage. We know that. But the bottom line is, because what of our unfaithfulness, faithful means we're committed no matter what it takes. Yes, this past week, on Thursday, we celebrated our 43rd anniversary, my wife and I. How many years for you guys on the same day? 32. Marshall and Lisa celebrated 32 on the same day. There's something up here because at least I share the same birth date, not year, because I'm much older than her. <laughs> but the fact is they are married on the same day, but made the year's difference. But the bottom line is this. In 43 years, you know what? My wife has had to really understand faithfulness because I've pushed that button. And I've had to do it because there's things that sometimes she's done. But I realize I made a commitment back on January, July, I almost said January, July 14th in 1979 at an altar to where I was on my knees on that altar. Because back in those days, I used an altar. And now I'll tell you what, we had a pastor pray for 15 minutes over us. Do you know that styrofoam can turn like concrete on your knees? He prayed us from birth to death. But he was a man who loved the Lord. And my dad, I think his prayer, one of his prayers was 10 minutes long. Our wedding went much longer than we anticipated, all because of prayer. The reason we probably made it is because people have been praying over us for a long time. But we had to understand something. We understood the faithfulness because we saw it in our parents. But we also understood it was going to take our act of obedience and faithfulness to the Lord. All through Scripture, what do we read? Remain faithful to me, the Lord says. Remain. That means in a continuum state of remaining in the faithfulness of God. I'll guarantee you, in this room, there's moments, and those of you're younger in your marriage, they will, your spouse will test you. You will have life circumstances that will make you wonder, do we stay true? As a pastor and as a police chaplain, I have been with many families that have had a tragedy of such magnitude as a child or whatever, and oftentimes I've seen it either it draws them close together or it shatters them because the fact is most of the time, those who draw together is because they've had the, the understanding of walking in Jesus' grace and hope. The others, they didn't have that. And so what happens, it may be a fracture to begin with, and this has finished the fracture, and they departed from each other and walked with pain the rest of their life because of not only the pain of death, but the pain, the pain of understanding that their marriage was not what God wanted it to be. 
But we understand when a culture begins to fall apart, we see what is Daniel saying here. We have been unfaithful. We read on now, verse 8. We and our kings, our princes, and our ancestors are covered with shame. Why are they covered with shame? Lord, because we have sinned against you. And he said, well, in unfaithfulness sin, sure is. But what he did is he just made a great statement of oversweeping understanding. We've sinned. And what he means, and when you understand the word here, it means every facet of the culture and life, we did not listen to God himself. That's what it means. Every facet, a part of the culture, whether it's in marriage, whether it's how we let ourselves be governed, all these things. Let's face it. You go back in the further parts of the Old Testament. Guess how God wanted to rule his people? It was called a theocracy. But remember what Israel said? Oh, no. We want to be like everybody else. Have we ever heard that in our homes? Especially with the children. Everybody else is doing it. Well, guess what? We're not everybody else. <laughs> We're going to do it God's way. But the fact is, give us a king. We want to be like everybody else. Okay, God said, Fine. Remember what he said in scripture? He said, I will let you have your king. But remember, your sons and daughters will be slaves of the king. You'll be taxed. And he went on and on. And don't we love taxes now? We are the most taxed nation ever in the history of the world. And we know it, don't we? But the bottom line is this. Why? Because we want to do it our way because we have sinned. Because when God said, I want to be your leader. I want, to, I want you to follow after me. And we said, no, we'll do it our way. That's sin. What's sin? Direct defiance to the commands of God. Simple as that. Sin is the direct defiance of God's commands. Let's don't complicate sin. Sin is sin. I understand in the Japanese culture they don't understand sin, sin, but they understand the word I just read before. We have been covered with shame. They're a shame culture, which means, and, and I understand, in the, after World War II, missionaries started catching on. How do we minister to the Japanese people? They didn't understand the concept of sin. They still don't, but they understand shame. You look at World War II, in the war, what did they commit as they begin to be defeated? Say what? Harry Carey. Bonsai raids. I mean, you hear Iwo Jima when you see that the CBs were in front with, with tanks that had the blades that were clearing off the lava and all that. The fact is, suddenly out of the ground, here came Japanese because they were out of ammunition, and they sacrificed themselves at the drop of a blade of our blades on our tanks, like a bulldozer. They trained pilots that were brainwashed to do what? Do kamikaze. Fly themselves into their ships to try to sink them. Folks, why? Because there was shame in the feet. That's why they cut, we captured very few in the percentage basis of, all, of prisoners of Japanese because they were willing to die because it would be a shame to be what? Captured. And I think the same thing we have to understand here as we look at it. We have a shame that's covered because we have sinned. I'm getting to the point, folks. You say, you get the point? I'm getting there. Because we have sinned against you, verse 9, the Lord our God is merciful and forgiving even though we have rebelled against him. When we sin, what are we doing? We rebel. That means we take difference to what was said to us and we're going in your face. I loved it when I had... I'll, I'll, I'll go back. You know, I told you I had a foster sister when I was 12, 13 years old. And mom and dad taught her not to be in the kitchen because kitchen is one of the most dangerous places to be when they're that little, before they're two. But one day she ran through when she thought nobody heard her. Now, the other thing was happening in the kitchen. But one time she came up behind mom. Mom didn't know she was there. And she put her hand up. And this is where the gas burners, you know. And she put her hand there. It was burned quickly. Well, tell you something. She had done what when mom and dad said, don't be there? She rebelled, didn't she? Do we not do the same thing when God says, don't do this or do this? Well, I'll do it my way. See, the world in America, what's happening, I'm just talking about America. Folks, we have become people that have rebelled against that of what God called us to be and do. We have not, and here's the summation what did Daniel say? We have not obeyed the Lord. Now, I could read on all the rest of this prayer, and it's all important because also in the middle of this, know what Daniel kept saying all the way through this. And I'm not going to say what it is yet. But we then come to verse 20. While I was speaking and praying, 
confessing my what? Sin. My sin. And the sin of my people, Israel, and making my request to the Lord my God, for he is a holy hill. While I was still in prayer, Gabriel, the man I had seen in the earlier vision, came to me in a swift flight about the time of the evening sacrifice. Now, I want you to know something. Note this. I know that we're under grace today. And I know that. And we're going to look at 1 John here in just a moment. But get this. Daniel understood something that we all need to understand. We cannot accuse everybody else. I have an alert for you. I have sinned. See, in our culture, we got to learn to say that. Not that we go around beating ourselves up. But we have to realize we have to take responsibility because if we've not been the people of God, that if we should have been, we would not be in the particular. Guess who's responsible? I am. I have sinned. Because we have not been the salt and light that God called us to be. What does salt do? Preserves. Salt and certain things. How many of you put salt in a wound? That <laughs> feels good. But you know what? It helps clean the, it cleans the disease. God calls us to take responsibility and say, I have sinned. We can blame whoever's in the White House or in Congress and everybody else. No. You know what? We have sinned. I have sinned. We'll say somebody, no, I voted the way I wanted. I knew I was right. What you think was right. You hear what I'm saying? Bottom line is we have to be people of responsibility before God to realize we are under grace, but yet we sometimes have to recognize that we have not always been the people of God that God wants us to be. Let's be honest, folks. If the church had been the church that should have been decades ago, we would not be worrying about what, what Madeline Hare did back in the 60s with prayer in school. We would not be doing other things. You know why? We need to stand. And now we have ever says we're reactionaries because we're trying to stand for righteousness. And there was a reactionary going on right now with Roe versus Wade now being reviewed. You know, now they're trying to codify, the, the Congress is, to be sure it's law no matter what. Now I'm going to say this, only political statement made this morning. We're thankful we have a Senate that hopefully stays the way it should for the time being between now and November. And don't allow it to be codified. Folks, we're called to be a people that recognize we, I, make it personal. I have sinned. Now I'm not walking around beating you up because the bottom line is, guess what? I realize there's times when I realize I should have taken some action and I didn't do it. I've shared with you before, not from a political standpoint, but from a standpoint of walking in obedience to Jesus Christ. And I've told you the story about, and I'm not going to go elongate it at all, but where I was spoken to by the Lord on a Monday to go see my neighbor on the section I lived in Oklahoma. And I said, God, I'll get there. I wasn't going to say no to him. I let other things get in the way because Satan's good at making busy get in the way, doesn't he? How many of us always get busy not doing what God called us to do? So get with me. Listen to me carefully. I said us deal with a Saturday night and sit with a family from 7.15 to 1 in the morning because the fact is a man at 54 years of age that God told me to go see, I didn't do it. I can't blame anybody else that said they sinned. I sinned because I didn't listen and I, diso I disobeyed the Lord. Now the difference is this. If you paid attention to your prayer, that while it's an Old Testament prayer, it really shows a lot about God's grace. All the way through we see Daniel saying, Ah, Lord, you are merciful and forgiving. <laughs> Praise God. So I want you to know something. We can dwell about how much I have sinned. But the bottom line is this. You have your Bibles. Turn to 1 John. And we forget this so often. I'm afraid we use some scripture in 1 John sometimes, which it speaks to unbelievers and does so. Remember, 1 John is written to the church. Remember, it's written to the church. And yes, it ministers to people that don't know Jesus, especially 1 John 1, 9. But I want you to know particularly chapter 2 in verse 1. Well, back up. i got to go to ch chapter uh, 1 in verse 5. This is the message we have heard from him. That's the Lord. And declare to you your God to you. God is light. In him there's no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. Uh-oh. <laughs> What's it say here? We claim, but we don't live it out. We lie. Remember, he's talking to the church here. To believers. 
But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. I want you to know something. We are under grace today. Note this. I have maybe sinned, but the fact is, I have a Lord I can go to and say, Lord, I messed up. See, I'm not here to go around. I can't carry your sin. I'm sorry. I can't give you absolution. The other day, a humorous friend, a friend of mine, he looked at me and he said, you know, Stan, I, I did this, this, and he was kidding. And I said, I'm sorry. I'm not a Catholic priest. <laughs> I can't give you absolution. <laughs> but I said, Jesus did give. And by the way, let's hear something, folks. And I told him on the phone, I said, listen, but one did give us absolution. It was Jesus. Amen? Jesus gave us absolution of our sin. Man, a priest can't do it. I'm sorry. But man can come to Jesus directly and say, I have messed up. I have sinned. And the Lord says, I know it. But you know something? He never said you weren't mine anymore, did he? We are still his. Isn't that wonderful? We have that relationship with him. That he loves us, as we saw that Daniel in the Old Testament understanding, understood that God was merciful and grace giving. Even though he says, man, we've been unfaithful, we have sinned, we've rebelled, we're covered with shame. Because we look why we're where we're at, because we did not do what you told us to do. And I didn't read all that passage, that prayer. But I want you to know, read it on. It tells you. The fact is, we did this, and we, it's been brought on ourselves. But you notice when verse 20, he says, I was confessing my sin. Guess what? He was making it clear with God that everything's okay. Folks, we understand in this church today, we understand we got to be careful that we do not sit in a position of self-righteousness. That we be sit in a position of only that by the righteousness of Jesus Christ, we're here today. Isn't that wonderful? We have the righteousness of Jesus. But I want you to know something. I want to read on. Verse 8. If we claim to be without sin, who do we deceive? Ourselves. Ourselves. Folks, we can know Christ, but we still are day by day, our soul and our spirit has been regenerated. Remember, hear me, listen to me very carefully. When we accept Jesus Christ, our Savior, and you confess your sin, your spirit has been regenerated into the likeness of Christ. Now, depends what year you got saved, whether it was in the first five years of your life or wait until you were 95. There are things that are going to have to get changed because there's habits and characteristics called that is part of the soul. That is your mind, all that, you know, like what do we read in Romans 12, verse 1 and 2? Be not be conformed to this world, but what? Transformed by what? Renewing of your, hello, mind. Those are the habits and characteristics that sometimes are unholy. And the fact is, yeah, we find, some, man, I screwed up again because I let the nature of man take over and I rebelled against God. And God says, I know your spirit's been mine, but the fact is we've got to bring that into line too. Isn't that wonderful that God wants us to bring into line with him? Note this. He purifies us from all. He forgives us. He's faithful and forgives us all our sins and purifies us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a sinner, a liar, and his word is not in us. Now, verse chapter 2. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not, hello, sin. Guess what? God's desire is, the fact is, you, I don't want you doing that anymore. <laughs> See, I find ourselves, it seems like we got a lot of teaching in the Christian church that says, well, you know what? Just go on and sin anyway because God will forgive you. Uh-uh. Read Romans chapter 6. What does Romans 6 tell us? What did Paul say? Do we go on sing that grace can abound? In other words, abound means that means that all oh, we say God's grace is going to keep pouring over me, pouring over me, and I can just go do what I want. No, it says, in the fact, Paul used two words. And you all of you know it already. God forbid. We don't live out a life of sin. Just say, okay, God will forgive me. I'll never forget years ago, I was called by, well, a police officer came by my house. I'm okay. I was in good standing. I, he came to me as the chap. He came to me as chaplain. He said, I just meet with his family. He said, they're very, rather new in the last year to Abilene, even though her roots were from this area, the mother, that is. They have a daughter who is in, they moved in, got all sorts of citizenship awards at the school where she was at in, in Washington State. And she had already now been kicked out of high school for three days because she had brought alcohol to school and they said they're paying they have a minister I don't remember who it was doesn't matter he said I just thought I'd brunch and you would you would you mind going by and 
visit with him and just talk with her if she'll listen. I said, sure. You know, when you walk in as a total stranger, you're not sure how you'll be received, you know. So it was like a couple days later, I called, and I Sunday afternoon I went up, and they were, they were walking. The dad was very gracious, and the mother was too, and they were in the kitchen. There's this young teenager. Didn't look like she was really rebellious, but, you know, you can hide a lot behind a face. And I'll never forget. And pretty soon we sat down, I introduced myself, and we just, just relaxed. I'll never forget we talked, and she made a statement on her own. Well, won't God forgive me even though I've done what I've done wrong? I said, whoa. <laughs> And so I went to word God's word. I said, let me tell you something. Caitlin was her name. I said, Caitlin, let me show you something, what God's word says about our character, what God wants us to be as we walk with him. And he pointed out the fact is, yes, he does forgive us, but God calls the heart to be changed because we are not wanting to do sin anymore. We want to depart from sin. And yes, when our best intentions, sometimes we do fail in our walk with him. And the fact is, God's grace is there to abundantly forgive us and walk in the wholeness of the power of Jesus Christ. Well, I... I think I've made it simpler that, re that day than I just now did here. But I want you to know, that young lady began to change in front of me. Oh. Now that day she didn't give her life to the Lord, but one long after that, newsboys came to Salina. And I've watched that girl come go forward and accept Jesus Christ, her Savior and Lord. Now I don't know where she's at with the Lord today. I really don't in the sense of her walk and so on because she's, she's living in Florida somewhere, I believe now. But the point is this. <laughs> we read in scripture I write this so you don't want to sin anymore to say oh I, I, I have free license no to know Jesus God, God's grace has not given us license to sin not at all but we're going to and sometimes what has happened in our culture we have been blaming everybody else and we forget I have to be responsible for my conduct, conduct and action <laughs> And I believe today God is calling the church. Can you own up to your own responsibility? And by the way, the church is you individually. I know the Bible tells us where two or three are gathered together in my name. There I am also. By the way, if you're out in the wilderness somewhere by yourself, guess who's there with you if you know Jesus? Jesus is. You say, well, I, then that means you won't sin out there. Hold on. You can have moments of sometimes, let's say, where are you at? I mean, I had a friend who got lost and was many days lost. And they were searching for him. And he said, you know the thoughts I thought about, why did God allow me this? And I got attitude. He admitted he got attitude, even though he was desperate. He said, realizing the end that my heart was not right where it should be, I found out by myself that I was living in a spirit of sinfulness at that moment. I thought, isn't that interesting? His, re his own revelation. So best, by the way, if it's just you and Jesus, guess what? You can sin. But the Bible tells us, I write this to you, that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, I love this. We have an advocate with the Father. Advocate is who? Jesus Christ. Advocate is the one who goes between. This is the word for an attorney. I know we make more fun of attorneys, but sometimes you're glad to have an attorney. Not many amens in the room here. I'll guarantee you there are times you want an attorney. <laughs> yes. And I know we live in a world that's all, we're so litig litigating type of culture anymore because we might be offended by somebody, so we have to get an attorney. But the bottom line is this. We've offended God, and we had an attorney named Jesus. He advocated for us. So I'll tell you what, but we understand if attorney wants to do, especially if it's in a criminal case and you're the guilty one, you know how only an attorney can help you? Is when you fully say, I screwed up and I sinned. Now, of course, nobody's ever guilty when you go to court. You notice that? No, I'm not guilty. We caught you red-handed. I'm not guilty. I'll never forget a kid. <laughs> this kid, he suffered in my hand. And he shouldn't have. Because I'm not the law. I'm a, I'm a police chaplain. But I'll never forget, we got a call that up on I-70 at night, night, people go down 70, saw two young men that looked like two AK-47s were aimed at their vehicles. So I'm with an officer, and I'll tell you what, it becomes a very interesting. You become suddenly very high-stressed and high-tensioned and high-motivated at that moment as we're flying down Buckeye from the south of Abilene up to 70. To see where these young people are at, or they said it looked like young people. 
So we look and we don't see anybody, but then we get a call from another officer said, uh, we see two young men walking into Country Mart here in Abilene with those guns. They got there. Now what they were, they were toy guns. They had covered and painted over the orange tips. Orange tips mean what? They're supposed to be a toy. But when you paint that up, you're in trouble. Well, this kid, they caught him red-handed. There's the toy guns. But the fact is, and, uh, and they're going, we weren't doing anything wrong. See, isn't that what we usually do? I never did anything wrong. And I'll never forget, they said that. <laughs> and so they handcuffed the one. They were talking to him. And then the officer was talking to some, one of the other young people, and they had him ready to put another car. The kid that was in the front seat in front of me, I, was, I had to move to the back seat. It was the worst thing Eric had done because what he had done is he worked his way. Paul, did you ever have this happen? Where they worked themselves out and got out of the, got the hink? Huh? Just one time. <laughs> if you, Folks, you read into what he just said, just one time. <laughs> they got his, got, somehow he got under here because it hadn't connected him here. Well, he's sitting there. And the next thing I know, I see his arms come loose and he drops the car seat back into my lap. I want you to know, he'd never been catapulted so fast in his life. Because I went, wham! And he hit the windshield and the sport, and all the officers looked at him. I said, him! <laughs> the not guilty one! <laughs> That's what I said. He's not guilty! And I smiled. You know what? Turns out he was a grandson of somebody I did his funeral for. <laughs> well, I turn, my point is this. Even though he was guilty, he needed an advocate. And folks, we sometimes have to realize that sometimes in our walk with Jesus, we have to say, I sinned. And we have to go to our advocate, Jesus Christ. Isn't it great we have an advocate? He's already taken care of the penalty for us. It's us going back to him and said, I messed up. I sinned. Alert. The reason America's in the conditions in is because the church, and I'm speaking corporately for a moment, has sinned. But let me say further, we got to bring it down to the grass roots because there's times I should have spoken and I didn't. Or I disobeyed and I was just willing to grouse rather than to act biblically. I sinned. But we have here an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Remember that. He's right. Only because of him am I righteous. What does it tell us in 1 Corinthians? That we are the righteousness of Christ in him. Get this. You're righteous through Jesus Christ if you know him. Isn't that awesome? But even in our righteousness, as we're still getting the old man changed, we still sometimes have to say, I sin. I need your help, Father. I grew, I messed up. I sin. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. What was that? What was Daniel? Back to Daniel chapter 9, if you were to go there. What was Daniel doing? He was confessing. He was confessing what he and the people had done. But then he said, I confess my sins. He was realizing I was part of the problem too. But, not, but the thing about it is, that's why we live on this side of grace. We understand that we have been given that opportunity to overcome. And I don't know this morning. It could be there's things in your life, as I said, like I said, uh, that might be really stressing you, and you're feeling such weight because of something you did. As I did this week, as I sat with my friend and heard the pain of his heart, not only just the loss of his mother, but also the dynamics within the family that were painful. Now, hear me carefully. I've been told by many others how the other part of the family was, and it was not a good situation. But down deep, I had to think a little bit it was about my friend, and I'll someday, well, we talk, I'll say, and I know what you've decided, but I said, how much do you bear the brunt as well? I believe as followers of Christ and as friends, we have a biblical responsibility to ask that question. I've been confronted by one or two of you in this room that have confronted me about some things in my own heart and spirit. And, and you know what? 
I know one time I kind of started to bristle because who wants to be confronted about our sin? Your, my sin. Who wants us to be that? Anybody? We don't like hearing it, do we? But you know what? I had to realize I have sinned. But I also had to know I come to Jesus. Not to repeat it again, <laughs> but to say, you know what? I have been covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. I go to the one who is my advocate and say, I messed up. I sinned. See, I, you notice how I do this all the time? I messed up. Because so often I think we just want to say, we soften the blow of sin. You know, I say, I say I messed up, and then no, I sinned. That means I've grossly hurt your character, Father. Heavenly Father, I've hurt your character. It's not comfortable. But if we're going to have an open relationship with Jesus, we've got to be open with him, don't we? We have to confess. And I think as a world we're living in today, and I'm speaking now, I'm going to broaden it just for a moment. We're living in a world that we've got to be careful. We individually do not go around passing the buck. And I want to tell you something. You might not like this. Whether you're Republican or Democrat, watch your mouth about how you speak about our leadership. Does it mean I like them? Probably not. Maybe I do. But I realize something. I'm guilty of sin when I disgrace the character of the office. Don't like the person always. But I'm called to respect those because God, tell you what, God tells us in his word. Read Romans 13. He raises up and brings down those leaders. For a reason. We might not always like the reason. But I think sometimes, and I've had people, and I don't hardly ever debate on anybody on Facebook because that's the stupidest place to do it. There's one time that somebody said something and they were asking me and I responded and I shouldn't have. Instead said, I should see you face to face. But I said, you ought to better understand some things. You better read your Bible. Look through scripture. He allowed Nebuchadnezzar to come to power. Look what he, God used, how God used him. Do we like Nebuchadnezzar? No. We look through all history, both in biblical history and regular history. God has raised up and brought down leadership for a purpose. Sometimes it's for a, as a discipline to those who were willing to say, well, it's not us, it's them. But then God says, no, you sin. And you're willing not to change. As we in a culture today, we've got to be very careful that we individually recognize we have a responsibility before God to live righteously because we have the righteous one that lives within us, our advocate, Jesus Christ. So this morning, I have an alert for you. But it's a different side of the alert. Do you think I thought, I'm going to say, I have sinned. I have an alert for you. We have an advocate named Jesus. Isn't that awesome? that we have been blessed with, that we don't, and if we pay the price for things, guess what? We don't have to wallow in our self-pity. We just say, God, in your grace, I might deserve or we are deserving what has come because we have not been the, what we should have been for you. But nonetheless, God says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I'll walk you through. God's there for us. Let's hang through to him. Admit where we've failed, where we've sinned, but don't live in that mentality. There's some of you, if I could probably point out my name as I close, I could point out to you saying, sometimes I want to tell you, would you please be quiet about your past? It's in the past. Jesus is alive now, and he changed the past. He's used it for his glory, whether it was good or bad, what you thought about it. Bottom line is don't dwell in the sin. Dwell in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Are you hearing me? Don't dwell in your past. I've got one of you looking at me right now going, eh, I'm guilty. <laughs> in fact, he's laughing right now. But, but you, it's easy to do. We live in the righteousness of Christ. Alert, we have the righteous one, the advocate, Jesus. Live, live, live in his glory. Live in his power. When you mess up, confess it. Oh, by the way, when you mess up called sin, confess it. And live in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And know the fullness of his glory. Let's pray. Father Lord, on this Sunday morning, as Daniel showed us so easily and so clearly, where he says, I confess my sins. But he kept saying through that prayer, you're merciful and forgiving, Lord. Even though he said, oh, we rebelled. 
Next line he says, we, we got shame on us. The next line he says, oh, we've been unfaithful. Lord, he kept pointing out what you were like. He knew what they had done as a people, but he did not dwell there. He realized that there's a God who's above it all. He's our righteousness through Jesus Christ. Lord, thank you for your word that tells us that we have this advocate. So we don't have to sin. We don't have to sit there and go, oh, I'm going to mess it up again. I know I am. No, we live in anticipation of living in the next joy of the righteousness of Christ that we're going to see fruit come out of our character because we're walking with Jesus, because we've been in the word of God. May that be us, because, Lord, if we're finding ourselves over and all, over and over falling into sin, remind us it could be we're not spending time with Jesus. And we're sub suspect to finding ourselves wallowing in our self-pity and sin. And then the liar comes, the accuser of the brother named Satan, will come and say, well, see, your past, obviously you didn't mean what you meant. And we have to say, hold on, I sinned. But I have been redeemed by my advocate of Jesus Christ. May we live in that victory. Delight in you. Let's not live in defeat. No, our world is going to the pot in many ways. Remind us of our responsibility to seek God with all our heart. Because only the righteous, it says in the word of, in Proverbs, that when the righteous rule, the people are at peace and rest. May, Lord, we see righteousness reign because the people of God have stood up to be righteous in their living life, and they've admitted to their sin, and they're walking in the glory of Jesus. Thank you, Father, what we have through Christ, our Lord. And we live and celebrate that victory, even today, in 2022. Today, on this date in July, we live in the delight, the victory of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray and we give you thanks. And God's people said, amen, amen and amen. Well, you know what? We have a commission called. Sometimes you say, well, we do this every Sunday, and you probably become almost, it's called, I call almost by rote, or maybe you're just kind of just blank it off. Don't. You have been called to live the righteousness of Christ. And what are we to do? Serve the Western heritage culture of the Smoky Valley region by reaching the uncommitted for Christ. Go rock the world for Jesus. Live in the advocacy of Jesus Christ. Amen.